Good morning. Butch Eichels, the Country Church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Good evening. It's good to see some of you brave folks out here in the midst of the uh, this winter weather we're about to be facing. And glad to have y'all here tonight on a Wednesday night to lift up the name of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I need to hear His name. I need to sing His name. I need to say His name. I need to hear His name preached, and then I need to respond to the Holy Spirit in His name. And so. Uh, let's do that tonight as we uh, as we stand and sing and praise the name of Jesus in this house. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me, and it tells me of a Savior's love, who died to set me free, it tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect and oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me, he's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul, the lily of the valley in him alone i see all i need to cleanse and make me fully whole in sorrow he's my comfort in trouble he's my stay he tells me every care on him to roll he's the lily of the valley the bright and morning star he's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul and he will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. There's a wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory, to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall Of ten thousand to my soul. And aren't you glad? Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this time that we have tonight. Thank you for a warm building. Father, we just sometimes take it for granted, but Lord, we praise you for a good, dry, warm place to come into worship. And so, Father, I pray that you'd bless each one that's come out tonight in a very special way. For those who are watching by live stream, uh, Lord, that you'd bless them also. Tonight, we pray for Brother Floyd as he wraps up this message. And, Lord, just use him, speak through him, and we'll be careful to thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Good to have each one of you, and I look out and don't see any strange, well, I see some strange faces, but you're not, you're not vis first time visitors. If you're here for the first time, if you just raise your hand, all right. The <laughs> Andy? Oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad you remembered. <laughs> 
Anyway, it's good to be in his house and uh, be praying for Brother Floyd as he'll come in a minute and give him your undivided attention. Amen? Amen. Brother. Let's continue to worship him and, and we'll eagerly await the word coming. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we Thank you, Brother David, and thank you, Brother Butch, so much for your presence tonight and uh, the joy that's ours to stand here with all the great friends that dared to come out on this night. And we're getting ready for wintertime, aren't we? Bad time. Well, we had a blessed day yesterday. The sun shined all day yesterday. Today, we was looking for it and couldn't find it. And I guess that's the way it's going to be for a few days now. I appreciate Brother Butch, our pastor, so much. As I said last week, he'd been my personal friend for 30 years or so. And uh, even when I was retired and living in Midland, 
uh, we kind of stayed in contact with each other, talking about this or that, whatever. And uh, I just appreciate that friendship. Appreciate that song. What a friend we have in Jesus. Isn't it good to have Jesus as your friend? And uh, if you don't know that, I trust tonight we'll say something, or the Lord, the Holy Spirit will say something to you, that you want to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I don't know what's going on up here in front, but somehow I know this microphone's talking back to me, so maybe they can fix it up there in the sound booth or something, and it won't uh, have this echo here. I also want to address those that's watching my live stream. Brother Butch, I never preached to such a crowd as I did last Wednesday night. I didn't have a clue very much what live stream was. <laughs> I talked to my sister in Atlanta, Georgia. She didn't know about it. I gave her the address. She pulled it up and watched me three or four days later. She watched you preach last Sunday or whatever. Yeah, last Sunday. She loves the country church now in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> I thought, wow, thank you for live stream. So I appreciate you tuning in tonight. And uh, I kind of feel like the old country preacher that didn't know much. And certainly I don't know much. I fit in there. But anyway, first time he ever spoke on a radio. You know, it wasn't very much of a radio. It did go out much past city limits. And city limits wasn't much. He was nervous about it. And so he didn't know what to say and how to address the group. And finally he said, Hello, world. <laughs> well, with live stream, that's what you're saying. Hello, world. It's a joy. <laughs> As we was asked for Brother Butch to give him some help, he's overloaded. I understand that with funerals. Bless his heart. Pray for him. Lift him up. Certainly his heart goes out to those folks. He wants to be there, needs to be there. Hold their hands. Pray with them. Encourage them. And then he asked us to just speak tonight and let him rest. And I understood. Glad to do that. By the way, I was told a while ago that I will be teaching our first class somewhere over yonder that way. <laughs> uh, this coming Sunday morning. And I uh, don't know what they're going to call the class. But anyway, it's been in the bulletin. I think it heads up a group of people that needs to be in there that's lost their mates. And that's my heart's desire to encourage people that's lost their husband, lost their wife, or maybe lost a child. I've lost two precious ladies of my wives. I think I'm qualified to know how you feel. You know, it's kind of strange how people will try to encourage you when you say something about, I lost my wife. Well, I know how you feel. Have you lost your wife? No. Well, you don't know how I feel. <laughs> That's just how it is. You can't. No way. I thought I did. I pastored all that time over here, hugged on people, was in their home praying for them, but I didn't have a clue the sorrow and the hurt they had of losing a mate until I lost my first wife, Nancy, and then the second wife, Sue. We'll be talking about Sue a little bit later. But I'm so glad to be with you tonight. I want to say that I spoke with a guy. A guy came up and spoke to me last Sunday, last Wednesday night after I spoke. I don't know if he's a member here or visiting that night, but he lost his wife the day before. It would be Tuesday a week ago, if I understood him correctly. His name is Spencer Drake. Spencer, are you with us tonight? If you know him and know how I can get a hold of him. I need to talk to you. I, I got something I need to give him that'll help him with his grief. And I've tried to reach out and I can't find anybody that knew Spencer. So I'm gonna talk to you as soon as service is over and find out how to reach him. He needs some help. And sometimes we men, especially, don't want to cry. And we feel like we don't know, really want to call on help. But we need as much help as anybody else harder for us to cry kind of kills us when we cry but when we cry it gives us relief and I've been giving her a little book that's so precious some precious friend of mine gave me when I lost my first wife Nancy and it is discovering the permission to grieve 
It tells it in a nutshell right there. It's okay. <laughs> and you need to read that book. And every time I read that book, it helped me. Now, it's not that big of a book. You can read it in maybe 30, 45 minutes, whole thing. But in another few days, if I read it again, it helped me again. And I reread it, and I reread it during those days to get some help. So I've been handing them out ever since. So I need to reach Spencer, given that book. It's a joy to speak tonight, and when I was called upon to do so, I didn't know exactly what to say, I, or title it, or give it a message title, or what to study. But immediately, the Lord speaks, and he says, Floyd, last Wednesday night, you spoke on the blessings of having friends. This Wednesday night, I speak on the blessings of being happy. Wow. That's a good talk. <laughs> I think that's needful today. I don't care whether you're young or old. <laughs> the blessings of being happy. In the book of Psalms 118 and verse 24 has been a verse that I've used for many years. And I say it every morning when I get up. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. In other words, I make up my mind for Dirk, my son, makes me mad, you know, whatever. <laughs> I, I make up my mind, I will rejoice and be glad in it today. That's my desire. And it has been such a blessing to me. So we use that as our text today. But in order to do so, we must determine to be happy. You know, I've seen some people, and maybe you have too, and if you're that way tonight, let me help you or let God help you in his word. <laughs> I've met some people that's so old and grumpy. And the saying is, they're just out of snuff. <laughs> that was an old-fashioned term. But you know what we're talking about. But there are some other people that's right the opposite. Brings to my attention when I was a young man, long time ago, <laughs> pastoring our third church, as I mentioned last time, I didn't last very long anywhere. But it was an old church, and there was a couple in that church that was real old, and this man attended. He was a precious soul in his 80s. His wife was an invalid at home and couldn't make it. Now, I'm her pastor, too. i got to go see her. And I dreaded it. I wondered, how in the world can I help her? I just didn't know what to say. I never met her. And when I knocked on that door, he greeted me, invited me in, and took me back in the bedroom where she was been laying for many years. I didn't hardly have to say anything. I'm glad to know you. I'm Floyd Osborne, and I wanted to come over and visit with you. And she took off. And she blessed my soul for about 30 minutes. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I never received such a blessing from a bedridden person in my life as that lady. She was quite heavy because she'd been in bed for many years, but oh, she was happy in the Lord. In order to be happy in the Lord, you've got to make a choice. You've got to determine, irregardless of what happens, you're going to be happy and trust the Lord for it. Uh, it sets the stage of, my, of your mind. It says mine. Also in Proverbs 16.20, <clears throat> It says, whosoever that trusteth in the Lord, uh, happiness will take place. Happy is he. Happy is he that trusts in the Lord. So it sets the stage, and God wants us to be happy. You can read in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and other places of what God did in the creations that he made. And you find that he says it was good. That tells me God smiled when he made it. Because I do. When I fix something, I just smile. I can't wait to tell my wife, Jenny, would you come over here and look and see what I've done? <laughs> I'm happy. I feel like we have a happy God. And he's happy with the creation. <laughs> that makes me think when Nancy and I was late 40s, this bodyguard I brought with me tonight, my son Dirk, he's six foot eight <laughs> when he stands up straight. 
he came into being. She was having some problems, and we went to a good Christian doctor in town that was recommended. And he just made a few examines, and he told her what the problem was. And uh, then she said, uh, he said, you better call your husband. I need to talk to both of you. And so Dr. Garza was his name. I think he was a member of Max Locato's church, if I remember correctly. Anyway, he prays over his people that he's taking care of during those days. I don't know if he's still practicing or not. Probably not. Probably retired. But anyway, as he counseled both of us, he said, now, because of your age, there's a high chance the baby will not be formed properly and might have some problems and so on like that. And we can terminate the pregnancy if you want me to, but I won't do it unless you tell me to. Or you have that choice. I don't know where he did it or he'd send it to somebody. I don't remember that much. <clears throat> I looked at her and she looked at me and well, we're old folks, but no, we'll take the baby. <laughs> so, Dirk, there was a question about you, amen? <laughs> Will you be here or not? <laughs> but I'm glad that he's here. He's a blessing to us, always has been. I'm thankful in our old age to have a son like him, my other son. I'm so blessed with He works and makes a living, has a hard job. He loves to cook. Him and Emory Live's got a lot in common. I think he can cook as good as Emory Live. I'll tell you what, he can make some stuff that's really something else. He made something a couple of days ago, and he said, Dad, I kind of spiced it up a little bit. I thought I'd better be careful if he said a little bit. So I ate it. I always eat upstairs in my living room porch looking out over the cow pasture. That's where I eat everything and visit and stay. But anyway... I came back downstairs, son, it sure was good. Only way I could do it is eat a bowl of ice cream at the same time. So <laughs> I'm blessed with two sons there in my house. I'm happy. So you got to make a choice. It, it affects the choice that you make. If you, if you choose to be happy, you, your heart and mind is set on it. You also recognize the leadership of God, and you can hear his voice like Jesus said, in John chapter 3 and verse chapter, chapter 10 and verse 3, that he calls you by your name. I like that. Our Father knows us. He calls us by our name. And in verse 4, he said that we would also know his voice. I like that too. Now, some people think you're crazy when you say, I heard God speak. I used to. I was so narrow-minded about it. They're crazy. You know, I just wouldn't believe that stuff. God was patient with me. He loved me. <laughs> he was happy with me, but he was gently leading me along. And finally, I understood he was speaking to me. I think last Wednesday night, I might have told you, but it's worth telling again. It was after I retired that I finally learned that Jesus really loved me personally. <laughs> I thought he loves everybody. John 3, 16 says he loves the world. I'm just one in the world. I'm not nobody special. But when I found out from him that he loves me like I'm special, I broke down and cried like a baby. It was about 10 o'clock at night. I woke her up. I said, Sue, guess what? She said, what, Floyd? I'd have sleep. Jesus loves me. Well, didn't you know that? <laughs> That's like a wife, isn't it? <laughs> Anyway, it's wonderful to know that he hears us and we hear his voice. Also, let me turn in Psalms 95 and read there. Psalms 95 and verse 1 through 7. Come, oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise unto the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands, is a, uh, in his hands are the sh deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. 
the sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Isn't it wonderful? So personal that we can be so involved with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the shepherd, and we're the sheep. And so it's wonderful there. How precious it is to hear his voice and feel that comfort as we follow him each day of our life. You know, you might think, well, God's just going to tell me what to say to somebody, or God's just going to tell me uh, what I ought to do in church, or something of that nature about his business. Listen, everything you do is his business. I do things around my house to make it pretty because I like it. But I feel God telling me, do this and do that. I think I'm through. The next day, God seems to say, Floyd, over there, you can do this. And I fix that. I said, Jenny, come over and see what I've done. And then next week, I'll tell her, Jenny, I've done something else. Would you come over and see this? God speaks to us. He's interested in what you do around the house, in the garden, and places like that. Across the street with your neighbor or somebody you need to visit. So it's so good to understand and hear his voice, so comforting. Truly, you can live above the circumstances of life instead of under the circumstances, like a lot of people will say. It is a choice that you make. If you don't make that choice, you're open to everything that the devil can throw against you and try to discourage you. I've known several people who have chosen to let Satan ruin their life. And you probably also know that so with people you know. And they never realized what happened. They always blame somebody else for it. If they did right and right, I wouldn't have had this experience. But they didn't realize they made a choice. And if they make the right choice, they'd have the right attitude. And so they, they come to the state of mind where they are never happy often because of this and that, how bad they've been hurt by somebody and been, uh, you know, left out of their will or left out of their love or whatever they might want to feel. Oh, listen, it's so wonderful. The man who made heaven and earth wants to be your friend. He wants to sit down with you on your couch in your living room and talk to you. <laughs> I like it. He wants to help you do something. He'll, sweet, he'll speak to you softly and tell you something maybe he wants you to do for somebody else. Make a phone call or maybe write a, write a card. You know, today it's, it's the iPhone thing and email. That's pretty good. I got where I can do a little of it. I like it. But prior to that time, I didn't. I had the old flip phone. And that's all I wanted. I didn't feel comfortable with nothing else. And I kept it until it went out. I bought Sue the iPhone that I got now, and she knew how to handle it. But I just listened. But I'm learning it. But before this time, how I enjoyed going to the mailbox and pulling that down and getting a card from somebody. Man, it blessed my day. And I just called about, thank you for writing. I just enjoyed your note so much. I encouraged my Sunday school class back in Midland. They don't write notes or didn't at that time. I said, and there was a senior class. I said, you'd be surprised the ministry that you can have when you feel like you can't do anything. Just write a friend. And on that card, you send them. You tell them that you love them or you made me mention something why and some event that y'all enjoyed together. It will bless their heart more than anything else, more than a phone call. I said, you know, because... <clears throat> They can pick that card up and read it and lay it down and later on they pick it up and read it again. And if they're like me, they never throw them away. They put them in a box and keep them. And one day on a cloudy day and you haven't got anything, you look through the box and you read them again. It's a blessing to write cards. Reach out to people because you care for them. Jenny writes the Barnabas paper. Some of you may get it. I thought, man, she's right on target. I was reading here on front page 
Be thankful. Gratitude turns what we have into enough. I think that's good, Jenny. <laughs> Gratitude turns what we have into enough and several things. God formed me, sin deformed me, and Jesus transformed me. Amen? That's good. You'd enjoy the paper if you wanted. You can get it. Talk to her if you don't get it. Called the Barnabas. The name Barnabas means to encourage him. So I've known a few people that has let Satan ruin them because of what's happened to them in life. But I've also known a few other people, irregardless of what happened to them, refused to let Satan in the door. And they're always happy. I want to close and not be long-winded. Our pastor's here tonight. I don't want to have him to walk up and stage said, Floyd, that's enough. Cut it off. <laughs> Last Wednesday night, I think I kept talking for 45 minutes. I just forgot how to put a period to it. Two people that's precious in my lifetime. One was an experience here in Marion, Texas in 2001 while I was pastor in Marion Baptist Church. This lady moved in here from a little place close to south, I believe it is, of Amarillo. And if you blink your eyes, you go through you missed it. And yet its name on the tag out front is Happy Texas. <laughs> you ever been there? <laughs> Happy Texas, you know where it's at. Anyway, her name was Patsy Broach. Her story goes this way, quickly. Patsy was a very blessed, wealthy Christian lady. Her and her husband lived on a 4,000-acre ranch at Happy Texas out in the country, raising horses and cows and like all ranchers do and having a wonderful time. She loved him. He loved her. She was so blessed. She had a mink coat, and I don't know what she had before she moved here, but when she drove in our parking lot, it was a brand new Cougar, two-door red car with a white top. Not a Mustang, but a Cougar, the Mercury. The man is a beauty. She would visit our parking lot and pray, is this the place? She did that several times, she told me. Finally, she knew that was the place. When she come in that Sunday morning, it was... We didn't have to greet her. She greeted us and everybody. That's just what she did. Like she'd known them all. Hug them, hug them. And uh, after the church was over, we didn't have a pianist. Emily wasn't playing during those days. She was just a little, ch little child, I guess. But anyway, young person. Uh, we found that Patsy went up and played the piano when it was over. I said, praise God, we got a piano player. Patsy said, don't you dare. You call on me and I'll embarrass you. I can't play a note by reading music. I play everything by ear. Okay. Learned that she and her husband lived on a 4,000 acre ranch in Happy, Texas. And one day her husband had a major heart attack and died in Patsy's arms. She didn't know what to do. She was convinced by the county sheriff that she should sell the ranch and move out. It wasn't safe for her to live out there by herself, and so she did. She gave the money that she got from the ranch to her three daughters, chose to move into the one that lives here in Marion, out here somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where, but at that time she was living here in Marion. So... As Patsy visited with us, and we got better acquainted. We really enjoyed her fellowship. She was so happy. She wanted to visit with everybody. We do have a friend who was coming. I've known them for a long time, a lot longer than Patsy. And Patsy saw that this lady was very upset, seemed like angry all the time. And Patsy had a burden to go knock on her door and visit with her. She did that at her house. And this lady said, yeah, what do you want? Just like that. Patsy, nothing. <laughs> and backed off. But that was Patsy. She wanted to get acquainted and try to help. She had that desire and that attitude. Her daughter also, she lived with, knew that Patsy had serious problems health-wise. And she, without Patsy's acknowledgement, enrolled her on the list, a waiting list. I think it was Autumn Winds Nursing Home over here on 3009. At that time, I think that's what it's called. Maybe it still is. 
But anyway, Patsy didn't know anything about it. So after a while, being in our church, she was needing some help and assistance, and all of a sudden, her daughter put her in a nursing home. And uh, maybe a year after she was in our church, something like that, it was, I didn't know anything about it, and all of a sudden, she had to go to a nursing home. I went out there to visit Patsy, and I dreaded it, because I don't like visiting nursing homes. At least I didn't then. I have a different attitude now, but I just felt so inadequate. What do I tell them? You know, I just don't know how to cheer them up, and that's what I want to do, but I don't know what to say. So I went out there to visit Patsy, and Patsy was just praising God. I am so thankful for my daughter, Pastor. She put my name on the waiting list here, and I didn't know anything about it. I thought, I can't believe what I'm hearing. That's what I was thinking. She said she had some insight. I just praised God for my daughter, and on and on it went. And so we visited Patsy, had prayer with her, and went on home. Next week, I went and, and visited Patsy again. She had a different attitude. We sit out there. She said, Pastor, I hate this place. <laughs> I said, now I understand. <laughs> But still, I felt in that, what do I do for her? How can I help her? But I understood. Plainly, I understood. Best I could, although I'd never been in a, lived in a nursing home. But consider, 4,000 acre ranch, a rich lady, mink coat, nice car, in a nursing home room where there's two beds and everything she owns in a closet, two foot by three foot. That's it. That'll do a number on you, won't it? <laughs> That'd cause you to be a little bitter. But anyway, she was down in the mully grubs. I sat there and I was thinking, what in the world do I need to say to help Patsy? And long in that time, Brother Butch, I began to hear the voice of God. I wasn't too tuned in to him in those days like I should have been, but I knew God said something to me. And I said, Patsy, I do believe that this is your ministry. She said, what did you say? I said, I believe this is your ministry. This is what God wants you to do. What? She just kind of thought about that a little bit. I don't remember what she said. But we visited, had prayer with her, and I left. And I come back the next week. And Patsy was busy. She didn't have time to sit out there and visit with me. Those people are sitting in a wheelchair in a nursing home like this, and, and saliva's dripping like that, and they hadn't had their hair combed, and sometimes Patsy was combing their hair. She says, Patsy loves you, and God loves you too. And she'd go on to the next one and help them. She would never eat her lunch until she helped feed everybody sitting around the table. And on and on it went. She enjoyed what God wanted her to do like nobody I never saw in all of my life. So I understood she was now serving the Lord and happy, and that was wonderful. I don't know how long that went on there at the nursing home, but it was short-lived, maybe a few months or a year or less, something like that, and she grew worse with her condition, and she was put in the hospital. I went out to the hospital to visit with her there, and we had a good time. She was always a very joyful person, wanted to encourage you, never whined or cried about nothing. Little bitty lady. And so we had a good time, visited, I guess, 30 minutes or so, and I had prayer with her and thought I'd better go and told her bye. Walked out the door, and as I was going through the door, Pastor, I looked back in, what, Patsy? Give me one more smile. <laughs> I gave her that smile that night. She was transferred to glory. What a joy she left behind of being happy. A lady from happy Texas. She sure lived up to that title of where she lived. Such a testimony to people. The, incidentally, the uh, home that she was in there, nursing home, enjoyed her so much when she was there. They gave her an honorary uh, minister's award of some kind. I can't remember how it was, but it was a presentation they gave her and hung it up in the hallways. It may be, still be hanging there. I don't know, because they were so glad that they had Patsy enrolled there, and her ministry blessed the staff as well. In fact, uh, I remember going to Patsy's room one time, and this lady nurse come in there, and 
she was kind of quiet and, you know, like she's out of snuff. <laughs> when she gave Patsy her medicine and left, Patsy said, you know, Pastor, she hates me. <laughs> but every time that she gave that medicine to Patsy, she'd say, thank you very much, I love you. But some people don't know how to take it when you say, I love you. I mean, all of their life, they don't know what happiness is. It's just bitterness and, and anger and argument. And that nurse was that way. But Patsy was different. She got close to that lady, although Patsy didn't really know it. And at the funeral service in our church over there, when we had the memorial, that nurse showed up. We had the privilege to share the gospel with her. And I don't remember the results, but we trust the Lord's work to be done. The last story I'd like to share with you is the joy I had in the last 12 hours or so with Sue before she went home. She had been going downhill for some time, and I knew that. It's just a matter of time. She's going to pass on to the home in heaven. I didn't want her to linger, be sick, and all of that. Hospices, as I said last time, had been called for the last 30 days or so and was helping out. She was at, on oxygen during the last week or so. And uh, I noticed that she was breathing very hard, struggling. I could talk to her, and she understood I was talking to her. She would nod. She couldn't say anything, but she would nod yes or no, something I might do for her, help her. And so about 12 hours before she went on to glory, I did something I never heard of before, Brother Butch but listened to us folks. It might be something you might want to do at such an hour. I didn't know how to handle it for sure, but I was trying to help her, and she seemed to not be able to talk to me at that time, just nod yes or no and blink her eyes at me or whatever. But the Lord revealed to me, Floyd, Sue is hanging on because she's worried about you. She thinks, she thinks you're going to have a hard time. You're going to struggle so much. So she's just hanging on, hoping to make another day in your behalf. Oh, wow. So I thought about that. So this is what I told my wife. I said, Sue, she blinked her eyes. I knew she heard me. I just want to tell you how much I feel blessed I've been your husband these years. I've enjoyed your love, your comfort so much, and I've enjoyed sharing my love with you. Now then, I want to tell you something that I think and feel with all my heart. We've both been blessed with a wonderful life for a number of years, not only with uh, our former mates, but also with church services and you singing and playing the piano like you and your kids did for so many years. We've had a blessed life. Now I want you to hear this from me and how I feel. I want to give you permission to leave this world and go on and be with the Lord right now. Do you hear what I said, hon? And she'd kind of blink her eyes. Well, she's still struggling with that breathing. That, like I said, for about the last 12 hours, I told her three times, I think it was that evening, about 6 o'clock, around midnight, I thought I'd better redo it again. Same words, practically word to word, reassuring her that I'm going to be just fine. It's okay. Check out and go home. And then that morning, around 6 o'clock, I told her one more time. And then that was it. After that, she was still breathing. I wasn't sure. It was around... Eight o'clock or so, I'd been with her at the bedside, listening to her breathe, and that's about all we did, just couldn't do anything else. Check on her, see if there's any blinking of the eyes that we might talk, we didn't. So Ladina, her daughter that lived with us, it's a nurse, really a big, wonderful help to us, had went to get a cup of coffee at the convenience store where she likes to get her coffee. She came back, I said, Ladina, I really believe your mom's already in heaven. Her body is not quite closed down yet. She's still kind of struggling. 
She checked in there and looked at her and said, oh, Floyd, come look. And sure enough, in the, just a, five minutes or so, I had checked out of the room. She had stopped breathing, and she went on. I enjoyed telling Sue that. Made me happy, made her happy. I like to live a happy life. I live a happy life today. I don't know of any old man my age that's any happier than I am. Now, I can't run the marathon. <laughs> I can't hardly run down. I don't even run down the post, the mailbox and back. I drive down there. But anyway, uh, I'm limited in what I do. I work a little bit and sit down a lot. <laughs> but I'm happy. In my mind, I'm happy. I talk to my kids. I call up my kids on suicide, talk to them. We have a wonderful time together. Happy. I'm going to die happy. I made up my mind. So that's what you need to do. It's a, it's a choice you make. This day is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, if you're not saved tonight, it's hard for you to be happy. There's some pulling in your heart and your mind about something you need to take care of. You need to really know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He makes you happy. I trust you'll trust Him. Heavenly Father, tonight we thank you so much for the joy and the privilege to speak, share our hearts and stories about life. And I'm so glad that there is wonderful blessings in being happy. We love you. We thank you so much to understand how much you love us. We're so appreciative of that. It's a blessing to know your love, feel your comfort, feel your presence walking with us, suggesting put a flower over there, <laughs> make something look pretty here, call somebody, write a note. Make a visit. Father, thank you that you created happiness. And we see it so clearly as we read the book of Genesis. <clears throat> it seems like when you created something, you smiled and said, it's so good. And when you made man, you said it was very good. We love you, Father. We thank you for your divine work in our lives and hearts. And I ask you to take care and tend the business of anyone that needs some extra help tonight in the service or if they're listening by live stream tonight that they will take the message at heart and talk to you about their needs and we'll thank you for it in Jesus name Amen oh, the Holy Spirit of God to take the word and to deal with our hearts and to draw us unto himself. Whatever that need is tonight, we let go and let him have his way. The altar's open. Just as I am without Just one like plea, we are. But that thy blood was shed for Lord, me. Lord, I'm going to trust you. And that thou be me come to the old land. Lamb of God, of I'm God coming. I come. I come. Amen. Almost thou persuadest me to be happy. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about quitting to wine. But uh, uh, from those of you who remember old Abel, Roberta said to him one time, I'll never remember, she said, I'll never forget, she said, Abel, be a man, start whining. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't need to whine, we need to be happy, uh, rejoice in the Lord, praise him, you know, for what he's done for us. Amen. Not what we don't have, but to be thankful for what we do have. Amen.
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this word tonight. And Lord, we thank you for Brother Floyd and pray that you'd bless him above ourselves. Father, thank you for his love for you, for his love for people. And Father, we thank you for the love that's in this place. And because of your love, we can certainly love each other. Father, be with us and watch over us. Bring us back safely, and we'll be careful to thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Be safe going home. Be safe and warm tomorrow. Choir, we'll meet just briefly tonight and uh, get you home soon. Okay.